Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, we are a webinar, a webcast, uh, online show, whatever you want to call us. Um, we cover a variety of uh, library topics. Um, the show is free and open to anyone to watch, and we do the show live on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. Uh, we do record all of our shows, so they're all available on our website, and the recordings are posted to our YouTube channel for you to watch afterwards. And we do a mixture of things here, presentations, interviews, mini training sessions, book reviews, um, basically anything library related we are um, happy to have on the show. And we do have a Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations and sometimes we bring in guest speakers. And that is what we have today. Um, on the line with us we have um, staff from uh, Kearney Public Library, which is right here in Kearney, Nebraska, a little um, west of where I am here in Lincoln. Uh, Matt Williams is the director there and Christy Wash the assistant director. And I think you guys said that uh, someone else was with you there too, I didn't catch earlier. <laughs> Sarah Hack, our Sarah circulation Hack. coordinator. Right, Sarah's there with them too. Um, and they're going to talk about some um, cool things they've been doing, extreme customer service at your library uh, and what they've done at their library. Um, I attended this session uh, last fall at our state library conference. Um, Nebraska Library Association and School Library Association um, has a conference in October. And I attended this presentation at a conference. And I thought it was awesome. I took lots of notes. And I thought it would be great to be able to share this with more people. So I contacted them and see if they'd come on the show. So they're here to um, talk about the um, great changes in the extreme customer service they've done at their library. So I'll just hand over to you guys to take it away. Hey, thanks. Uh, our presentation today is, of course, about extreme customer service at your library. And uh, we uh, feel that while providing innovative services and programming uh, helps to draw new, new uh, patrons, excellence in customer service is what keeps on coming back. So we've recently embraced a more patron-focused approach to library policies. And that has included changing many policies to create a more positive experience for patrons. Um, what we'd like to talk to you about today um, is, um, in a nutshell, uh, how to keep your patrons happy by uh, being nice. Uh, about us, um, just a little bit so you know a little bit about us. Uh, we serve a population base of 46,000. Um, the main library in the Buffalo County Bookmobile is what we have. Um, no other branches. We have 40,000, almost 41,000 cardholders, about 20 FTE employees, collection size of 165,000. Uh, our 2014 circulation is uh, 523,000, and um, we get about 231,000 visitors a year to our doors. So what inspired us to take this extreme customer service approach? Uh, one of our management team, one of our division heads, had watched a Web Junction webinar called Extreme Customer Service. And she thought it was really excellent and ended up passing it on to the rest of the division heads. And in turn, we all watched it and thought it had some really great ideas. The webinar focused on changes that libraries can make to have a more patron-focused approach to customer service. And it also pointed out different brands that excel at customer service, such as the Ritz Carlton Hotel and Apple. Um, a little bit from that webinar, at the bottom there. The presenter talked about customer service as a mindset, not a set of rules. It was also um, emphasized that you need to think about the patron and not your own institution. Um, all of us want to provide good customer service, and as a librarian, if you don't want to provide good customer service, you're probably not in the right profession, she said. <laughs> Um, many of us say that we provide good customer service, but that's something that you can always improve on. And I think we thought here that we had good customer service, but we have definitely improved it with the changes we've made. 
<coughs> our patrons expect us to provide good customer service, and they know the difference between good service and bad service. Um, every interaction with a patron is an opportunity to exceed their expectations, and so we not only want to meet their expectations, we want to exceed it. Um, so once we listened to that webinar, the management team discussed it, and we decided that this is an idea we really wanted to embrace and try to implement at Kearney Public Library. So why did we change? Well, we had this fabulous opportunity with a new building. Um, we were rethinking how we did different processes. Um, we had expanded space, so we were reworking how staff um, did their jobs, and so it gave us an opportunity to rebrand, to redo our policies, and kind of put a whole fresh face on the experience at Kearney Public Library. Things weren't bad, but like Sarah said, you can always improve. So we started questioning, why are we doing these things? <clears throat> What's the benefit? And is there maybe a better way to do it? And what do we, um, which led to, what do we do that upsets patrons the most? Is it something that we've just been doing for years and, you know, maybe it doesn't really have a purpose anymore? And how much would it cost to make the changes? Is there a monetary cost? Is there a PR cost um, in terms of goodwill with your patrons? So we looked at things that were upsetting the patrons like um, replacement items. Someone messes up a book or a DVD and they go and purchase one at Walmart, bring it in. Well, we didn't before except that just because you never know if you get what it is you want to replace in the collection. We reevaluated that. We had a last processing fee, which was kind of, you know, our service fee for processing lost materials. Um, we changed all the new books from seven days to 14 days. That was patron feedback that said, gosh, I love my new books, but it's so hard to get through a bunch of them in seven days didn't cost us anything except stickers to change it, um, and the response was immediate and enthusiastically positive of, great, I now have two weeks. I think a lot of them probably still return them in seven days, but the idea that they have 14 days and they don't have to stress about it, they love it. Um, how much would it cost to make the changes? You know, do we have the ability to forgive fines without messing up our budget? Can we replace some of our fees and rethink how we do that? We found that the cost was minimal and was offset by the increase in good public relations. So to build on what Christy was saying, um, uh, as she said, we looked at these things. In fact, uh, I remember I came in and we have division, we call ourselves division heads, we're the managers here. We had division head meetings and I came in and I said, um, I've been thinking about what annoys our patrons. What, what annoys them? What, what makes them name annoyed with us? And, and I want, you know, us to kind of, and we do this a lot in our meetings, kind of have a, uh, put our thinking caps on and have a brainstorming session and, and uh, what annoys people. And, and the things that she mentioned were some of those things. Um, and we thought, well, how can we, um, how can we change these so that people aren't annoyed? Um, and so we had specific policies we changed. Um, a lot of libraries, I've worked in two or three different libraries, and, and it was always the policy was we don't accept replacements. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, the reason is um, we don't know if you're bringing back the same thing as you lost. Uh, maybe we don't want that anymore. Um, you know, we want something different, uh, and and so on. And, and not that those aren't bad things, but my my take on it was, well, you know, how often does that really happen? How often in the year does somebody just come in with something, and does it really hurt us to take that item? Does it really? You know, is it really worth having an argument with a patron, forcing them to go back, take that item back? Now, we don't encourage people. If they call us, we're not going to tell them to go buy an item and bring it in. But they, if they do, uh, we 
tentatively take it, give it to the person in charge. Once they ascertain it's actually the same item that we lost, we accept the item and it, people go away uh, much happier than they did before. Uh, we eliminated the $5 processing fee on lost items. Um, that was put into place, I believe, because we were trying to stop people from continually paying for items and then bringing them in and getting a uh, refund. It was not, the $5 was not refundable, it kept people from just using that and, and continually saying they lost something, bringing it in again. However, the processing fee really annoyed people. And to tell you the truth, we already charged people the full price of an item, not really the price that we paid, but the price that it says uh, it's worth when you go on uh, Baker & Taylor or Amazon. Um, and so we're already really getting from them you know, a little fee on top of it. So we eliminated that. Uh, we used to try to catch people and make them pay their fines by not letting them use co uh, library computers. Now, the more I thought about that, the more I thought, you know, the reason, what is the reason that we fine people? It's because um, they're not, we don't trust them to bring their items back on time anymore, and it hurts other patrons. Well, using, I'm pretty sure they're going to return the internet on time. So, uh, we just don't see that as, as connected in any way. There's no, I mean, no reason they can't use our computer, use our internet. A lot of times they're looking for jobs and things. How are they going to pay their fines? They don't look for a job. Um, they, I, I really think they, that that was a good thing uh, to do for people. Um, we give pay, patrons the benefit of the doubt on claims, returns, items. We give them one freebie. Uh, they say they returned it. We say, okay, you returned it. We're giving, and we tell them, we're giving you a freebie today. Um, we're going to take your, the benefit of the doubt. We do mark it so that the next time they do that, we say, well, you know, last time we gave you a freebie, but we really can't keep doing that. Uh, we changed the checkout time, as Christy said, on the new books. That actually came from a board member that came to us and said, uh, Richard Miller had come talk to the board. He said, you need to get out in the community and see what they want. So this board member went out in the community and listened to them. She came back and said, they want two weeks on their books. And we had heard this before from patrons. We, we thought, well, why not? I mean, if people don't like it, we can always go back at some time. So we changed them, put new stickers on them, and, and as Christy said, very enthusiastic reception on that. So how do you change the climate in your workplace and start making some of these changes? Um, shift your focus from the library to the patron. As Matt said, we really tried to think about what things the patrons were particularly uh, bothered by and tried to focus on those to change at first. Um, we're continuously evaluating policies and processes that come up to see if we can do something to change them. For example, another one that came up recently was we have patrons call often who are on their way to the library. They ask for an item. It says it's checked in on our system. We say, we'll have it ready for you. Hang up the phone. We go to the shelf. We can't find it. Needless to say, when the patron gets here, they're not very happy that the item isn't waiting for them. So that's something that we had to evaluate recently to see what we could do to solve that situation. Um, question what you are doing. Why are you doing it? Is it because you've always done it? Is there a real benefit to the community? Always just kind of keep tabs on what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, consistency is important too. Communication is key to success. Keep the staff informed of changes so they are consistent in processes. They also need to read library newsletters, know what events are occurring that day, you know, what craft is going <coughs> on upstairs, what is the movie that is being played that day. Um, and then they're better able to help patrons with questions. Changes take time, so make it easy for the patrons and for the staff. We had changed um, printing systems not too long ago, 
which was a change for the staff and for the users. But we tried to offset the change for the patrons by giving them a dollar's worth of free printing on their library accounts each month. People are really excited about that. Empowering staff, in order to keep the momentum up for making these changes actually happen, um, we continue as a management team to lead by example and constantly encourage staff to make decisions. They certainly have, um, you know, we have guidelines with a policy manual, but they have latitude to make decisions based on their best judgment. <clears throat> so we keep encouraging. Some people are comfortable with that and some are not. And so um, as managers, we continue to work with people. But the other piece of that is as a management team, we need to support those decisions and emphasize to the staff that if you decide to waive a fine for someone, that is fine. It's really good to keep us in the loop so that if that patron comes back or some other fallout occurs, we're not blindsided by it. And we just keep emphasizing that um, as we have staff turnover, it gives us an opportunity to refresh the existing staff and then introduce the new staff to the whole concept of they have the power to make these decisions and to run with them. Um, if it's time consuming for the staff, how do you make it easier? And that as a management team is an ongoing challenge to look at, okay, is this the most efficient way? Do we need a need to move these five pieces of paper anymore or can we do it online? Can we just take that process out of the equation altogether because it no longer has a purpose? So we continuously challenge ourselves as management team to look at that too and encourage the staff to give us input on things they do that perhaps there's a better way to do it. And last but not least, of course, is to take pride in the library. We are, prob we are the largest public face of the city in the community. We have about 800 people through the door a day, and so we need to put the very best face on for the city of Kearney that we possibly can and take pride in our work. Smiling when someone walks in the door, it is huge, it costs nothing, doesn't take that much effort, and certainly is um, in everybody's best interest. So we uh, make sure that that is a priority and everybody knows that's the expectation. Um, because when someone walks through the desk, they don't know if they've got the library director or they've got one of our pages or one of our cl new clerks. It doesn't matter. They should have the same positive experience regardless of who they get. Um, and just a word uh, to just continue that a little bit. Uh, continually question, as she said, your procedures. Some uh, library procedures don't change for years and years and years. Uh, we, we, everybody, we, we try to get them to, to think about what they're doing and, and question, why am I doing this? Why are we doing this for? Why are we continuing to do something like this, you know? And to, um, you know, uh, to just ask, you know, could this be done easier? Do we need to do it? Do we need to Really, uh, we, we quit taking paper, um, and I know this doesn't work for everybody, but we quit having people sign up for cards on paper. They, we just do it on the computer, they sign the card, and, and that's it for them. Um, that, that has cut out so much time. I mean, we used to spend hours and hours and hours trying to pull defunct ones out of the system, trying to put the new ones in, trying to get them right and and how many times did we pull that thing out to look at it again zero we never did so um, that was something we cut out that saved a lot of time and um, also I would agree with her on take pride in the library and think about your experiences when you go to a store or another library and think of the bad experience um, and as uh, Lou Grant used to say to Mary Tyler Moore, you know that way you are? Don't be that way. So. <laughs> I'm destroying the table as we sit here. Um, and what is the most important? Focus on your basic services at your full potential before getting wrapped up in additional services. 
and that doesn't mean don't add things. We've added a lot of things here, lots. But it, what it means is if you're not doing the basic services at the best possible way you can do them, there's no point in adding another service will not save your library. It will not increase people's love of your library if they're not coming into your library and getting that positive experience to begin with. Um, and you can have every service in the world, but if people coming into your library don't feel welcome, they don't leave happy, they're not going to come back. So get those basic services right before you just try to save your library by adding new services. Um, and I want to say the most important asset of any library goes home at night, and that's the library staff. And uh, Okay, personalizing service. Um, you know how when you have a good customer service experience, you feel like you have the full focus of whoever is helping you. We try to make sure that that is what happens here, is that no one feels um, that we're trying to rush the transaction, even if there are people behind you in line. Take the time, do it right, make it positive. So how can you say yes? People come in with uh, all kinds of questions, and um, I'm sure all of you have lots of stories you could tell. You thought you'd heard every question in the book, every possible scenario for <clears throat> why the book or material was damaged, why they don't have their card, etc. It doesn't matter. How can you say yes? How do you meet them halfway? Can you forgive a portion of their fee? Can you um, help them work on a payment plan because that's just going to give them some peace of mind and helps gives them an opportunity to have a successful transaction? And sometimes you just have to give the, the public benefit of the doubt. Um, once you're in your library for a while, you have a sense of who your population is. Some people you know are going to try to push the system every single time. Do you handle them a little bit differently? Perhaps, but it still should be as positive an experience as you possibly can. Um, so you use the guidelines that um, help you keep the patrons from abusing the system. That gives you some structure to how you handle things. But does it also allow you to say, oh, you know, you have a dollar fine and we had two snow days and people weren't getting out. Can we work with you on that? <clears throat> Absolutely. Look at that. And, and another thing is don't, don't punish everybody for what a couple people are doing. Uh, I've seen that happen too many times. A procedure or a policy is put into place because you have a couple of annoying uh, patrons that do something, and so we say, "Well, we're not going to learn that we can't let them do that." So we change a policy that hurts everybody. Uh, so don't don't punish don't punish everybody. Deal with those people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You can limit those people what they do without limiting everybody. And you may not always be able to say yes. It doesn't mean that you can accommodate every single situation. But if you can lessen the impact to the best of your ability, it means you've made the effort. And that effort um, will go a long way with people. I ask for input. And um, this says act on the suggestions of patrons and board members. I'd say also add in there staff members. Listen to suggestions that people give you. Um, if a patron gives you a suggestion, uh, you know, it may or may not be a good suggestion, but give it, uh, give it its due. Think about that suggestion. Think about whether it's good. Listen to your board members. Our board members, you know, we had the one board member that said, hey, we need to change that, you know, the, the amount of time you can have those new books out. So we did it. And uh, listen to them. They, they're they coming to you, and they're coming to you sometimes to talk to other people. And, you, you know, you can't accommodate everything that somebody's saying, but you can certainly, um, and, and don't be afraid of failure. That, that's another thing, that it, trying and failing, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you try something and it doesn't work, what do you do? You, you just don't do it anymore. You change it back. <laughs> or you try the next thing. 
Um, it, it, no harm, no foul, I guess, or other sports analogies like that, I think of. Um, but, um, you know, we, we did a strategic plan recently, and, a, and we did a formal survey, and that was really interesting, and we got a lot of surveys back. And what did, we found out a lot of interesting things. First of all, people really, really loved the library. It was overwhelmingly positive. But no matter how good something is, you can improve on it. And they asked for things. They asked for um, that we remain open on Sundays year-round. Well, we're going to do that. We're going to remain open on Sundays year-round. Um, we um, had some other things. I'm trying to think of what were some of the other things we were going on there. Um, cleaning the discs. Cleaning the discs. That was another one. Should we, um, you know, please clean your discs? Well, you know, they're not, they're not really aware of how many discs we have uh, and the time it takes. But one of the things that I'm looking into to ask for in my next capital ask is a multi-disc cleaner um, so that we can clean our discs faster and do more of them at a time. But we're trying to go through our collections and do that. Um, so you want to make changes? I'm just going to tell you where to start. You can start with some really basic things if you want to embrace this idea. Greet patrons when you see them come in the door. It's really easy. Sometimes you just need to smile, say hello, wave, do something to acknowledge their presence if they're coming in the door. It makes them feel welcome. They'll feel more comfortable approaching the desk and asking questions if they have questions later. Don't point people in a direction. Show them. If someone's looking for a book, we ask the clerks to walk them to the stacks and help them find it if they need assistance. Sometimes we even go get the items for people. Sometimes that's just easier for them and for us, so we do that. Make service as personal as possible. Do the best you can to say yes for what they're asking, or at least send them somewhere where they can get an answer if we can't solve the problem for them here. Frontline service is the most important. No one is exempt. Everyone here is expected to know the basic routines at the front desk, whether you're management or clerk. If you're walking by and there's a line, you're expected to jump in and help so people don't have to wait. And the staff members know that they can always call the management out from their offices to come and help at the front desk if they need help. Communication is key. And that is a big one. You have to communicate between the management team and the part-time staff. The staff themselves need to communicate with each other so they know what's going on with different patron situations or what policies we have changed and why. And the library also needs to communicate with the patron. That's one of my biggest pet peeves is when people call here, and we say we will get back to them, we need to get back to them, and we need to do that in a timely manner, even if it's just, you know, we're still working on it, but we wanted you to know that we're still working on your issue. They need to know that they haven't been forgotten. Another tip is explain what you're doing. A lot of times people will come up to the front desk, they'll ask a question, and clerks will immediately start to look things up on the computer, maybe won't say too much to that patron about what they're doing. Um, let them know. Let me check in the system to see if we have that book. I don't see the book in our system. Let me check on Amazon to see if I have the title correct or if I'm spelling things correctly. Um, sometimes we turn the computer screen around so we can walk them through and show them what we're doing on the screen. This just helps them to know how we are trying to help them. <coughs> Think about your bad experiences. Do not recreate those. You can help it. <laughs> How would you want to be treated if you walked in as that patron with that particular problem? Try to go that direction. Answer the phone, email, etc. ASAP. I kind of just touched on that a little bit. Um, but if patrons email and want a book renewed, we need to do that as quickly as we can. If it sits in there for three days, they might have a fine after that. We don't want to cause that problem for them. So get back to them as soon as possible. Acknowledge patrons when they're waiting in line. If you're busy at the front desk, the phone's ringing, just signal to people 
that you will be with them in a moment, let them know you need to get the phone, and then you will help them. If you're the only one up at the front desk, let them know that you'll be there to assist them shortly. You just need to find somebody else to help cover. Usually people are perfectly happy to wait. We actually had several compliments from people lately that have said they don't feel like they ever have to wait at all. They said if they're in line, somebody pops out of the back room very quickly to help them, and they really appreciate it. Um, avoid transferring patrons when possible. Make sure, try to not send them on a wild goose chase if they have questions. Um, sometimes people have complicated things, so you've got to figure out where to send them. But that comes back to communication with the staff. They need to know <coughs> who's in charge of what areas and where to send patrons with particular questions. And the more people know, as Sarah said, the more people that know how to do things, the better. If they come to the front desk and they ask you how to use, uh, that they're, you know, they say, I'm having trouble with my e-reader, uh, we try not to say, well, you know, you're going to have to wait an hour because the one person that knows how to do e-readers is out of building. Uh, we, we try, this is, and this is an ongoing training situation to get people to do this. Some, some take it on easier than others, but we, we try to have everyone so that when you come up to the desk, the first person you get is the person that helps you and not, you know, and, and, they, and some things are more complicated, of course, and you can't do that, but as much as possible, we try to help people so that the first person they encounter is the person that helps them. And a lot of these things you can do. Um, even if you have a small staff or just one person, you can always be friendly and you can always, you know, uh, explain things as you're doing them and you can, and, and many of the things we've mentioned. Um, share your success. So you've done this, you're successful, people are happy. Collect stories. Our staff collects stories. And what do we do with these stories? We um, we give them to the board every month, every two months actually in our case, um, so that when they are with somebody, um, they can share them. They can say, hey, did you know at our library this happened? This is a great opportunity. This is a great thing that happened. Um, just yesterday, a couple of staff members realized that maybe we weren't sharing all of our stories with everybody on staff, and so they um, share them with the rest of the staff so everybody knows and feels good about um, the successes that we have and shares in that. And um, you know, document them, use them for advocacy, um, use them uh, when you're giving a talk somewhere. Um, they're great, great things to use. And they can help increase uh, the importance of the library, um, help make the people aware of that. And all of that goodwill, when you have those stories um, that we share among ourselves, it kind of gains momentum unto itself. Um, with our bookmobile services, we reach all of the communities in Buffalo County, which involves um, small libraries in the area as well as lots of schools. Um, sometimes there are kids who have fines by no fault of their own because mom and dad don't take care of it. It doesn't seem quite fair, perhaps, to punish them for their parents' lack of um, attention to it. So we've made an effort in the past three years or so, at the beginning of the year, to forgive some of that. If the materials are back, can we waive those fines so that that second grader or that kindergartner can get back out on the bus? Because if mom and dad aren't taking care of the fines, they probably aren't bringing them physically to the library, which is out of town. We want to take down the barriers as much as possible. And as we all know, things happen in life that um, mess stuff up and they're out of your control. Um, we had one recently before Christmas, was working with a patron. I got a nice note. Um, I think his son is about a fourth grader. Got a nice note from his dad that said, I had no idea all of this was going on, had been through um, a life change, and thank you so much for letting me know that we, my son can use the bus again and for just taking the time to make the effort um, 
and I will be on top of it from here on out. So thank you. And you know, it's it's always nice to know that what you've done has had an impact too. So one or two of those um, will keep us going as a staff too to keep looking at what we can do better. Um, another piece that fed into that is we do a food for fines thing once a year. So you can bring in canned goods or non-perishable goods and get part of your fines forgiven. Well, on the bookmobile, that's a pretty fun thing too because those kids will bring in the beginning of the school year. They can start with a clean slate, gives them another opportunity to address um, you know, fines or whatever's going on on their account. We don't use it for the lost materials. That's kind of a separate beast. But um, a lot of times, if we can get the fines out of the way, we've got a lot of progress and headway. And, and in the same vein, you know, somebody in their early 20s goes <clears throat> in the library and says, we say, hey, I see that you uh, have all these huge uh, fines and fees from when you were, you know, 12. <laughs> and, uh, Welcome back. You know, <laughs> Welcome back to the library. Well, we, 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 we usually forgive those right away. We don't try to visit the sins of the parents upon the children. So uh, we leave that to God. So, <laughs> but um, we, 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 uh, you know, we just try to, to look at things and think, you know, reasonably be the person that you want to encounter when, when you go to the library. And we are open for questions. Okay, great. Yeah, no, we're here. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to. There's always a little delay with getting unmuted sometimes. <laughs> great. Thank you very much, um, Matt, Christy, and Sarah. That was that was great. That was like I said, I attended the session at our conference and thought there was some really. Uh, Great ideas in there. Um, we did have a comment from one person, I think Sarah, when you were talking about the customer service and uh, taking them to the actual things they knew, not just pointing. Someone said that one of their library mentors referred to, um, the, he's calling them, golden retrievers rather than pointers and setters. And that's a nice, you know, way to describe the difference in how you would provide that kind of service. Um, and just, I did have a couple of questions here that I just, I just wanted to let people know. Um, Yes, the slides that um, they used today, um, Matt has already sent them to me. They will be available afterwards when the recording is posted. And um, I've also found the um, webinar that you guys watched from Web Junction and added a link to that as well will be included in the show notes afterwards. So you'll be able to watch the Web Junction one that um, these guys base their changes on. Uh, so we do have some questions coming in. Um, Ah, what training has your staff had for dealing with angry or irate patrons? How do you handle that kind of situation? Most of the training is in-house training. We, we actually, as an uh, ongoing thing, do scenarios at all of our um, staff meetings. Um, we, we hand out scenarios. Everybody uh, reads the scenario. We say, what do you do in this case? And then we talk about the cases. So we don't, it's not quite role playing, but it's a little bit um, similar to that where you would, um, they give their answer and then we all discuss whether that's the right answer. So we do a lot of in-house training. Mm -hmm. We also encourage if there's any, any opportunities uh, close by, they can go to them. Uh, and <coughs> we try to make them aware of any kind of webinar type things that are available. They want to listen to those on their own. Mm -hmm. We try to emphasize to them to, you know, kill people with kindness. If somebody comes in and they're really upset, um, try not to aggravate that further or fuel the fire. Just stay calm and don't take it personally. Take the time to listen to what they have to say. Usually if you listen to what they're trying to tell you and you are actually listening to what they have to say, that in itself will help them calm down pretty quickly. And you can always pass them up the chain. Mm -hmm. Go to the top. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, and by the way, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Matt Kovar if he's around because he was in on this originally with us. And he hasn't died, but he has done Papillion. Right. So, yes. Yeah. He was when I saw this presentation at the conference in October. He was with Christy and Matt. Um, but now he has moved on to a different library here in Nebraska. <laughs> okay. Um. 
Next question. Has anyone does have any questions? I know some of you are already typing in. Just let you know. Use your GoToWebinar interface. Type in the questions section, and I can uh, see them here. Um, next question we have is: uh, Have you considered not charging late fees at all for late returns? <laughs> we we sure uh, we're all for it. Uh, unfortunately, there's a there's a hard reality out there. Cold hard reality, and that is City Hall. Um, once you're taken in fines and fees, it, it's extremely unlikely that City Hall will ever give up that income. Mm. It, it just doesn't happen. Well, we have been able to freeze ours for many years. I mean, we got up to a quarter, and we haven't gone up, I don't know how many years since we've had a quarter, quite several years now, and we haven't, and we have dropped other fees. Mm -hmm. And Last year, we dropped two or three different fees, and um, they never said a word mm. about it, mm -hmm. um, and but it it's a reality. We all know that probably fines aren't the best way to um, get people to behave, but um, they are something that cities are used to, and it's it it would be. I would think it would be the odd the odd city indeed that would allow you to. Give up that income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was something I was going to ask about that I think I remembered you mentioning at the conference was the city pushback on some of the things and basically trying to figure out what can you, to put it bluntly, get away with that they don't notice or, you know, just do it and see. Like you said, they didn't notice some of the things you did, so. You'd... Well, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't feel the need to, to ask, you know, permission for everything I do. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, but you know, if it's something big, all our policies are passed by the city, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, all our fines and fees go through the city, so they do know about them. And, uh, you know, it's not, we have a very, very good relationship with our city. Um, and certainly don't want to irk our city in any way. Mm -hmm. But um, they realize, I mean, we were able to tell them, hey, you know, why are we charging this $5 processing fee when we already charge them more for the book? It's not fair to our patrons. And, I, and they could see the wisdom of that. I mean, they were going to fight us on Yeah, that. the logic is there, yeah. Um, okay, next question up we have is, how do you usually go about gathering your staff and community suggestions? How are you collecting those? Well, the survey we did, we actually made available online. We did. Uh, we had a blast. We we worked. You know, we got the president of the chamber to be on our committee and got a free email blast oh, nice. out of the deal. Uh, and so we were able to get um, to send out the um, the the survey that way. And so we got a lot of responses that way. We had paper at the desk so people coming in could do it. We also tried um, also going out to certain places. Uh, that had mixed results really going out. We had surveys at, uh, at the senior center. We had surveys at YMCA. We had, uh, I don't know if I'm missing anything here, but we, what we, we got a lot of them back. And then when we, the last week when we did the email blast, we, we had a, a whole bunch more that came back that way. Um, we also just listen, you know, our board is out in the community and they're talking to people. Mm -hmm. They're talking to their neighbors, they're talking to people in line, they're talking to their colleagues and they're, and they're coming back with these stories and you know, listen to what people say. Mm -hmm. And, then, you know, we actively solicit input at um, programs to say if you've got an idea for a presenter, you know, uh, there's a topic you'd like to see, whatever it is, um, keep us in mind. and. We've all got our name badges on, so it's very apparent whose staff are in the building, and they can grab anybody who's got one of these bright green lanyards on to, um, <clears throat> you know, if they've got a question, they want to share something with us, we make ourselves as visible and approachable as possible. Mm -hmm. But as far as the staff input goes, I think everybody's pretty comfortable just walking into my office, and they'll be like, hey, I was thinking about this. What if we did it this way instead? That would eliminate this part and it would make it easier for us and for the patrons. They're not shy in giving us new ideas and we try to encourage that. Because they well. know we're not going to shoot them down and you know? we're not going to just say well, that's a stupid idea. You know? Yeah, you know? they know we'll give it thought and 
if it doesn't work out for some reason, we'll explain that to them and they are understanding. So we're going to break mm -hmm. that. You know, these strategic plans are important, and it's important to get community involvement. Like I said, we, you know, uh, somebody from the chamber, somebody who's a business person in the city, those people have uh, an ear to what's going on in the city that they can input and they can also help you get the word out. So it's important to have those relationships. Mm -hmm. Connections and networking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the next question actually is kind of leading off what you had said, Christy, just now about tailoring. Um, someone wants to know how about tailoring library programs to customer demand. And it sounds like that's something that you have encouraged. <laughs> Um, I have. Um, one of the things that I do is there's an arts and crafts program for adults. Part of it grew out of um, adults coming to our arts and crafts program during summer reading um, with their kids. And the kids were doing crafts and the parents were going, gosh, this would be really fun. I'd like to do it too. Yeah. Okay, so you act on that. Well, then it grows and we do it once a month, um, different topics. I'm always looking for presenters because I am so not Martha Stewart, <laughs> but I'm game to give stuff a try. And that's the biggest thing is that people are willing to come in and play. And it has really gathered momentum on um, people bringing projects that they think we could do as a group. And if the group says, great, let's do that. So we put it on the schedule for next month. This year I solicited input on what their favorite things were last year and then new things they would like to see this year. And then we'll just plot that out for the next 12 months. And so it becomes a patron-generated um, program. Another one that kind of did that is we did knitting, beginning knitting classes last spring. And um, we did formal classes with projects the for, for four weeks in a row. Well, that group had so much fun together, they said, gosh, we'd like to keep meeting. So we have just reserved one of our meeting rooms, and they show up weekly. Wow. Um, they, are, they also like the fireplace, some of them, because I, I, I walk around the library, oh, there's a group of knitters around the fireplace. That's, that's <laughs> it. Right. Like, so you got the right environment for it there. <laughs> well, we do, and it uh, keeps, you know, it keeps um, feeding itself because the folks who have been a part of that knitting group for a while are happy to help the new beginners. The library has an introduction to knitting packet, so when someone new shows up, they have the basic tools and the skein of yarn and a project to get started on. Um, and it's become a time of, I mean, this group has become good friends, and they just love it and continuously are thankful that we have a space for them, and they really hope that the space doesn't ever go away. So. And, it's, it's exciting to see that happen. And the, and the survey um, explicitly asked um, what types of programs people liked the most. And, and we had a, three or four different um, examples of programs that we had, and they marked the ones that they liked the most. So that was kind of interesting, too. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, the next question we have up is, and I think this is kind of, I'm assuming, logistics. How did you solve the problem of people calling for items and locating them before they arrive at the library? Um, I assume they might be asking, like, how does that all logistically work out? I figured that question was tough. <laughs> it seems like a great service, but, yeah, I can see implementing it and fig making it work could be. We just don't answer the question. <laughs> 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 what we've tried to do recently, if someone calls and specifically says they're coming down within the next 10 or 15 minutes, um, is we'll either have the clerk ask them to hold while they confirm that the item is available so they can run out to the shelf and make sure it's there, tell them it's here, or we'll just let them know that um, we'll go grab it and we'll give them a quick call back just to confirm that we have it here and so they don't drive all the way down mm -hmm. here and then end up not getting the item. Um, Notice that happened very often that we go to the shelf and not find it. Not often, mm -hmm. occasionally. But we figure it's better to save those few occasions and at least let the patron know we'll keep looking for it and hopefully find it within the next couple of days rather than have them make a trip down here and then not have it be available. Make sure you confirm back with them before they leave their house, yeah. Yes. So call, yeah, call them back or keep them on the line while you go work either way. Mm -hmm. And that's basically something you worked into your basics it's just a service we provide so when someone calls and wants to do it you just it's part of the job now 
We, yes. we, we try to go out of our way. I mean, if the bookmobile is here and it's parked in the garage and we look on there and we see the books on the bookmobile, we try to go back and get mm -hmm. it out to the people. Uh, it, it always helps if there's a bookmobile person around that actually knows where the book might be in the bookmobile. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so many possibilities. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, that's the last question we had. Anybody have any other questions? Go ahead and type them into your GoToWebinar interface so we can grab them. Um, we just um, the show. Um, I'll just let you know because there are a few uh, technical questions. Um, the show is being recorded, so um, it will be um, processed sometime today potentially, and will be posted onto our website. Everyone who was registered and attended this sh registered pre-registered and attended the live show will be sent an email letting you know when the recording is available and links to the slides. Um, well, the slides will be available and um, links to uh, Carney Public Library's website, the Web Junction webinar, and those other documents you got you showed there of your, uh, or on the next slide. Um, those will all be added into the Library Commission's delicious account where we collect all the, any, any websites and think, links that are related to any of our sessions here. So that will all be available. Um, along with the recording, and you'll all be sent an email letting you know when it's ready to watch. And please don't hesitate to contact us. Our information is up there and would be in with the slides and things like that. We are happy to visit. Um, if you want us mm. to share our policies or our strategic plan or anything like that, just let us know. I'll email them to you. Mm -hmm. We're actually in the middle of updating our policy manual once again. Mm -hmm. It's a yearly thing now because we we looked at it so many times. That's a good idea because you, like, you're making so many different changes. It's always good to keep up, keep it up to date with what you might want to be doing and what needs to be, you know, what, like you were saying, things that have just been around for years and years, uh, revisit them and figure out why. And we try to, as often as possible, make things procedures instead of policies so that we don't have to have them in stone necessarily. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't look like anything um, urgent has come in while we've been chatting. No other questions. So I think um, we can um, wrap it up for this morning, unless you guys have any other last comments. Where's the wisdom? Go, go, go out and, and do good and be nice. <laughs> be nice. That's a, that's a great motto, yes. <laughs> um, we're just getting some thank you, great suggestions, great ideas, comments coming through, too. All right. Well, then, thank, yeah. you, thank you very much, Matt and Christy and Sarah. I was glad to have you on the show. That was great. Um, I am going to pull back presenter control to my computer now. And do, 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 there we go. And as I said, all of the um, presentation, uh, all the links are here on our delicious account. So you'll be able to get them um, afterwards. Uh, the show has been re is being recorded as we speak, and it will be available here on our Archive and Compass Live Sessions page, where we post all of our previous shows. The link to the recording, which we post to YouTube, will be here. Link to our power the PowerPoint slides will be here, and um, link to the uh, Delicious page with all of the websites. And then that that will wrap it up for today's show. Thank you very much for attending, and um, I hope you'll join us next time when the to our topic is the accidental cataloger, tips and tools to help you use the rules. Uh, Emily Nimsikant is the cataloging librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and she will be with us next Wednesday to talk about, um, to help you give you some ideas and things to use if you're not really a cataloger by training or trade or previous experience, um, and you've just been dumped into the position potentially or it's been added to your job um, that she'll give you some tips on that also we are on Facebook so if you are a big Facebook user please do go to um, like us on our encompass live page on Facebook there we go uh, we do post when new shows when recordings are available on here uh, log in um, reminders to log into a current show uh, when new th shows have been added um, that accidental catalog one was a last minute addition to our schedule for next week so I did a reminder about that this week so if you are big on face um, and using Facebook please do go ahead and like our Facebook page uh, other than that that will wrap it up for this morning thank you very much for attending and we'll see you on future shows of encompass live thanks bye bye